Shoplifting. Uh, f oh no, I should have done that afterwards, shouldn't I? I should have said 5432. 5432. Five, <laughs> anyway, all of the stuff I've just said, if the public are watching, they'll have heard it anyway. So welcome to each and every one of you. Uh, and I'd be grateful if you could each introduce yourselves. Thank you. I'm James Lowman. I'm Chief Executive of the Association of Convenience Stores. There are 50,000 convenience stores in the UK, and it's our job to represent them to government. Good morning. My name's Sophie Jordan. I'm the manager of the National Association of Business Crime Partnerships, the representative body for business crime reduction partnerships <coughs> in the UK. Morning, everyone. Adam Ratcliffe. I'm the operations director for Safer Business Network, a non-profit organisation that owns and implements multiple crime reduction partnerships. Thank you very much indeed. We look forward to the evidence you'll give us. And if I can just say, as I'll repeat at the end, if there are things you haven't had the opportunity to say you think we need to know, please feel free to write to us pretty quickly uh, at the end of this session. Uh, Lord McInnes. Thank you very much. And my question is focused on Mr Lohman, but please, the two witnesses feel able to come in. Um, we've just had really compelling witnesses from the world of academia and from a larger chain of stores about the effect of shop theft, as I'll now call it, because that's my learning point of today rather than shoplifting, mm. and the impact um, both on the U across the UK in a more general way, but also on larger stores. And I guess what we're particularly interested in this evidence session is that of smaller businesses, especially convenience stores. And if, James, you could just explain to us the impact of shop theft on those smaller stores. But I think something we're particularly interested in exploring is the rate of reporting from convenience stores and what your members feed back to you in terms of feeling able to report and the response they might get from the police. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, so a number of pieces of information I can, uh, I can refer to. Firstly, we ask our independent members about their experiences of shop theft. Has it got better? Has it got worse in, in, in the previous um, period of time? And that creates a shop theft index. Mm -hmm. And that has been rising consistently at quite an alarming rate since about 2021, summer 2021. So over a sustained period of time now, the proportion of retailers reporting an increase in shop theft is, is, is going up and, and, uh, and continues to. Mm -hmm. Across the whole sector, um, an illustration of some of the costs of crime. So about a quarter of a billion pounds um, attributed to the cost of crime as a whole. On top of that, actually more than that being invested in crime prevention measures. And when you add all of that up and divide it by the number of transactions in the convenience store sector, that, relate, that, that equates to a 10 pence per transaction tax, if you like. Um, if there was no crime, every time you um, tap your card or paid at the till, it would be 10 pence um, uh, less. That, that is the, the scale of the, of the, of the financial um, cost. Um, but there are uh, far greater impacts than that even, and particularly the impact of violence. And we know that shop theft is one of the biggest triggers for violence against shop workers and indeed the retailers themselves. Uh, you challenge a shop thief. Often people who are committing these offences are in a heightened state. They're often um, people with dependency and, and addiction problems and they are desperate in that situation and that can escalate very, very quickly. So um, it can be, a, you know, the biggest single trigger for violence in stores is, is challenging um, someone who's stealing from, from the store. And that tallies as well with the information we get on who are the people committing the offences. Um, they are usually often repeat offenders, as I say, people with addiction problems, often well known to the people uh, running the stores, often two, three, four person crime waves in a housing estate or a village. We often know who these people are, but they continue to, to offend. And what's probably changed as well as that volume of, of theft has been, if you like, the brazenness, I'm not sure that's a word, but the brazenness of the, of the theft. So rather than people sneaking in and stealing some items, people just clearing whole shelves. And, and that coming with a degree of, 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 of threat to the people in the store that's, that's very um, strong um, as well. So 5.6 million incidents of shop theft, 76,000 incidents of violence uh, in the sector um, last year. I think that th those figures are underreported. So moving to your question about reporting, I think no one has a really accurate figure because a lot of retailers just don't bother to report crime. They don't believe anything is going to happen. If they do report it to the police, and um, they, they, that's therefore the, the most effective thing they think to do is, is just not to report. Now, we are starting to see some changes in that, we're turning around that vicious cycle, if you like, and in some areas, we're seeing much better protocols on reporting. 
So the, uh, a simple online systems for reporting crime, followed up by the police, information given back to the retailer about particularly identifying those prolific repeat offenders who are responsible for so much of, of the crime. But at the moment, the, the biggest barrier to a retailer reporting is they just don't think anything will happen. And often it can be quite a laborious process mm -hmm. to go through to, to, to report that crime in terms of providing the images, giving witness statements. It can take a lot of time out for the retailer or their colleagues to do that. And there just isn't the faith that the police or ultimately the courts will intervene with effective penalties against those prolific repeat offenders. And that's a vicious cycle we we have to uh, get, get ourselves um, uh, out of. And just on that, if I may, Chair, in terms of inevitably the proximity as well, the convenience store to the community, does that add a level of fear of intimidation or repercussions if people are known within the community? And it's going to be very obvious that maybe a sole trader with two other members of staff who may well be the same family report someone as well. Absolutely. I mean, the, 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 um, these people live next door to yeah. colleagues. I mean, there, there, there's that, that ultimate proximity. Over half of customers walk to a convenience store to mm -hmm. shop. Mm -hmm. Nearly half of colleagues walk to the store. So that, that the colleagues are drawn yes. very much from the local community. So um, the, the, there is that, that, that proximity, and that does make it that much more real. Um, and it means that colleagues are sometimes, sometimes fearful of coming to work, leaving, going home, um, you know, the threat, I know where you live, is not an empty one. Yeah. Most people do absolutely know where they live because it's next door to them. So there's a, that, that level of, of, of threat is very real. And we are now seeing more retailers telling us that it's yeah. harder to get colleagues to come and work in stores. Um, it's harder to retain colleagues. And that's because where there have been incidents or where there's a threat of incidents or just because they see myself or Paul Gerard or someone else talking about this mm -hmm. very serious issue in the media, that they think, well, is this something that we, we want to be exposed to? And certainly family members say, well, is this, this, is, this is the job we want you to do. Now, obviously, I yeah. think there are lots of great things about working in the local shop. There are great local, secure, flexible jobs. So I think there are lots of great reasons to work in the local shop. But I understand reservations from, uh, from people, and that is starting to have an impact now on our recruitment and our sector. Sophie, I don't mean anything to add on. I think the thing to add there is also it's the frequency at which a lot of these sort of volume crimes are taking place. These prolific and persistent offenders that, as James said, are local, they are also offending at such a rate that the impact that has on the members of staff within those stores that are seeing them every day, potentially frequently and several times a day, mm -hmm. you know, we've got offenders that are 80, 90 offences in a two or three month period in the same store, if you work in that store, the impact that has on you is incredible because you, that feeling, and it's the, the difference between actual crime and perception of crime, the fear of crime, your perception is that nothing's happening, these people are offending with no possible outcome coming against them, so they're gonna come back the next day and come back the next day. It's having a significant impact on the people who work in these stores. And we are hearing as well that members of staff are having to be moved to different stores because of the things that James mentioned. Just before we move on, on that very point that's just been raised, have we got any figures that illustrate the difficulty in recruiting people to own, to manage or to work in convenience stores as a result of shop theft? I haven't got data which would point to direct cause and effect. We certainly have some evidence from members who, who are talking about this as, a, as, an, as an increasing challenge, but I can look to try and find some of those examples and provide uh, the committee with them. That would be very helpful if you could find anything to help us. Thank you. Baroness Busk Buscombe. Thank you very much. Um, we, we've had quite a, a fascinating first session, and so this is very helpful um, as well. Um, I want to ask about the most effective strategies there are dealing with shoplifting by prolific offenders and organized crime groups from both a business and policing perspective. Um, I want to ask, in, in that context also, um, are we not now talking about a cultural thing? So it's more than just saying we need stronger presence, uh, we need to pursue all lines of inquiry, we need to focus on repeat offenders. There's a massive cultural issue here, isn't there, whereby so many people now think this is easy street and it's a lawless situation. What can we do in terms of involving the public more and public awareness of what's going on in their villages, their towns and their cities? Um, if I could start with you, Adam. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, one of the issues around this is 
we need to be able to talk about the positive work that's going on behind the scenes to try and raise awareness of that as well. Yeah. This is always the problem, and I think this impacts the police involvement a lot of the time because they are they are criticised from every corner of, of society, especially at the moment, and almost don't want to put their head above the parapet to talk about anything unless they absolutely have to because they're going to just receive criticism. And when something is so drastically underreported as shop theft is then the idea that we then sort of start to delve into it and get a real idea of the figures, that's never going to come across amazingly well. You've got senior officers who are going to feel like they're criticised because their forces aren't dealing with an issue properly. So we can't then talk about what's going on because it will reduce public awareness... Well, sorry, reduce public confidence because it raises public awareness. Um, the cultural thing, yes, as James mentioned, one of the big changes of anybody who's working in this sector for a long period of time is you'll see the change in behaviour from the prolific offenders. Nobody even has the audacity to kind of run anymore. <laughs> but the people are walking out of stores. People are challenging, when they're being challenged by staff, they're saying, well, what are you going to do? Whereas at least a certain number of t you know, years ago, they were making efforts to be a bit more furtive with their behaviour and, and get out. So I think this comes into the, the key strategies that you ask about that I think are effective. There's, there's two main areas, really. It's in the sharing of information and intelligence, and it's the multi-agency collaborative partnership working. It's about the right people who have got interests in this sector mm. coming together to work collaboratively to try and address the issue. Because actually, talking about having you know, no police resources to address volume crime, we can't keep banging the drum of what are you doing about shop theft. Instead, what it needs to be is we need to be able to go to the police and make them as efficient as possible with their resources by the private, the third sector and industry working collaboratively to paint a much clearer picture so that the police are able to be very efficient with their resources, go after that anecdotal figures, 10% committing 60, 70% of the crime in an area, those local offenders that have been named by the staff in those stores, the wealth of information and understanding and knowledge in this industry is huge, and it's an untapped resource because of that fear of tapping into it and seeing the true scope of the problem. So I think if we're able to get past that and start actually looking at the problem-solving element, that would be huge. But again, it comes back to that public perception because the more it comes out into the media that there are potentially 8 million incidents of retail crime and less than 4% has been reported to police, that's a huge issue as well. For example, recently, I won't name the town, but there were five police on show um, spending hours in the centre of the town, the market town, uh, sort of sort of there available to chat about domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. Now, why can't they do the same, perhaps, in terms of making people aware of uh, these appalling crimes, which, you know, we, we're hearing they're not even using the word robbery. You know, this is serious crime. Domestic abuse, of course, is serious. But is there an issue around prioritising? I mean, Sophie, you might want to comment too, and James. Yeah. Oh. I certainly think there is. Uh, with retail crime, it's often looked at as a monetary value, and they don't look at the actual personal cost to individuals and people working in the store and the effect on customers as well. Um, so I think it needs to be looked at um, as a more victim-based crime, whereas when you have a victim of domestic abuse in front of you, it's very clear who that victim is. Um, so I think it's about um, raising the awareness of the victim impact of it. Well, perhaps uh, we can get a bit more detail on that, uh, Lord Dubbs. Yeah. Right, thank you. This is addressed specifically to you, to you Sophie. Uh, can you explain a bit more about how business crime reduction partnerships work and how they operate to reduce acquisitive crime and violent crime against businesses, their premises, staff and customers? And if you could add a little bit about information gathering and sharing work experience. Thank you. Um, business crime reduction partnerships are independent, not-for-profit organisations and their role is to bring a community together with a partnership between the businesses, the police, local authority and other key stakeholders like drug and alcohol homeless groups, bringing everybody together in a community to um, address and prevent crime and disorder. Um, being a member of a business crime reduction partnership is um, subscription based for businesses. They're funded mainly by subscriptions for, from the member businesses, as they're self-funding. And to be a member of a BCRP is probably about £500 a year per premises. So we're not talking a great deal of money. And for the return on investment that you get for that £500, 
you'll be provided with the tools and services that you need to prevent yourself from being a victim of crime <laughs> and, to, um, and, and the entire community. They'll often offer a walkie-talkie radio network where in a, a town you can communicate with the other businesses around you, <coughs> sharing real-time information about what's happening now to actually prevent that. That's also supplemented by an online software incident and intelligence reporting system where you can report the incidents that are happening in your shop and in, uh, for example, in a town centre setting, if everybody's reporting those incidents, then um, crime trends are spotted and that information is analysed. Um, you'll be invited to briefings and uh, intelligence meetings as well, where, which are also attended by police and other agencies such as probation and the other agencies that I've mentioned with the business community, providing that feedback as well on what's happening. Um, so, it, and also the BCRP will deliver a lot of um, national safety priorities, such as um, Ask for Angela, if you, if you know about that, about um, violence and harassment against women, and um, Safer Business Action Days, and Safe Spaces. So not only are they supporting the business community, but also doing so much for um, community safety as well. Now, where the data sharing element of that links in, is um, via the online intelligence platform and the real-time sharing of information live on the radio network. So when an incident happens in a store, um, members are encouraged, member businesses are encouraged to report everything that happens in their premises or nearby their premises, whether that's thefts or violence or abuse, um, prevented thefts, um, antisocial behaviour outside, street drinking, drug problems, whatever the situation might be that's affecting your business premises and the perimeter, we ask for it to be reported. Um, we then analyse this information and build up this whole picture of what's happening in the local area. Because we've got community buy-in and we're sharing this information, often these people are recognised and named, so we're enabling offenders to be identified at a much earlier stage than they ordinarily would be if we were working individually in silos. So we're able to cut through all that, um, the low-level crime, and the Business Crime Reduction Partnership will deal with the low-level crime building up an intelligence profile of who the most prolific offenders are, notifying the businesses of who the most high-risk people are that they really need to watch out for, enabling them to prevent that crime happening again to themselves or to their neighbours, um, and also flag up with the police who the most prolific are. So we're giving the police actual workable crime reports that they can actually get a good result on. And then when we do get that good result, we're feeding that straight back to the businesses so they can see the action that's <coughs> being taken. And that in itself then forms that momentum of it's important that we report, we need to report because action is taken. Um, so it just builds up the whole momentum and um, uh, the buy-in and engagement in the Business Crime Reduction Partnership. Could I just ask before I, I move rapidly on to Baroness Prashaw, um, we, we are largely looking at shop theft, shoplifting. Uh, so, a uh, simple question. Do shops within any of these areas regularly get involved in these partnerships? Do they, is it the majority of them, just a few of them, or are they involved in other partnerships so they feel they don't need to belong to this? The majority, I would say, do support business crime reduction partnerships and buy into them. However, there are... Um, many corporates who as a rule will not buy into business crime reduction partnerships and this is why the engagement aspect is key because if you're investing in your by corporates are you referring to the corporate shops like corporate the retailers co as opposed to the convenience stores absolutely yeah um so, so convenience it, stores do join in but the the, the brand names well the high street well-known names don't a lot of high street well-named Name, known names that do buy in. Yes, they do, but others don't. Right, so just on the point about involvement in partnerships by convenience stores, um, off, that many will be involved in, in business crime uh, reduction partnerships. 
Um, but some, by virtue of their, their location, may be less likely to be involved. So our heartland is probably outside of main centres, housing mm -hmm. estates, villages, mm -hmm. those sorts of areas that may not be big enough to have their own partnership. And it could be they can be part of a wider town or, or regional partnership, and many are, and, and obviously some do operate in town centres, but for some they can feel quite isolated because they don't have that network of other businesses directly around them. So that can be a barrier for involvement. For some well, of them that, 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 if I can stop, because that very neatly leads us on to the next question from Baroness Prashar. Baroness Prashar. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is really for Sophie, and Adam may want to come in. Um, mine is really a question about what are the factors or measures need to be in place in order for these partnerships to operate more successfully and effectively? Thank you. Um, so the factors for more success for business crime reduction partnerships, I would say the first factor would be funding, uh, because each of these independents are uh, these these BCRPs are independent and self-funded by the subscription from businesses. And yes, there is a lot of involvement and buying from the big corporates and also the smaller shops as well. Um, however, bigger towns have more resources than smaller towns, and it's often the smaller towns that need uh, you know more um, involvement. Uh, so it would be really good to have that um, sustainability in the funding, which will then help to raise consistency so we can all operate the same. Um, so with funding and sustainability, um, regulation and governance is also important as well. Um, and this would sit quite nicely under, for example, the police and crime commissioners and also the funding aspect as well. Um, so the, that would be more regulatory if they were to sit under this umbrella and we could have more standardisation um, and governance across the UK. Um, engagement is really important as well, uh, so ensuring that the um, head offices of the big corporate companies and uh, people on the ground as well, so throughout the whole level there's that engagement, so it filters all the way down from the top and the people on the ground are engaging, attending the meetings and working mm -hmm. together as a community to prevent crime and, and, and seeing your role not just in your shop but the benefit to your shop and the benefit that it brings to the wider community as well. Um, sharing of data as well is incredibly important, so that comes with the engagement aspect as well. Um, being confident to share and know that your data is secure and not being scared to share information. I think those are the main factors. I think the legitimisation is, is huge here. BCRPs have organically grown from what often were referred to as shop watches and pub watches, very small schemes of, of a group of businesses working collaboratively to support one another. And they have grown over the years. So you will have some that are still in that very small kind of, you know, that system works well for them, but you've got some that have grown to, you know, thousands and thousands of business members. We are still dealing with personal relationships when it comes to statutory partners. We've still got our teams building relationships with individual police officers in order to create a partnership work that then as soon as that police officer moves on to another area, that process starts again. So our drive is to try and create legacy policies that it doesn't matter which officer comes into that position, they know that there is a crime reduction partnership in operation in the area, who they work with and what they can do and how they can be part of the solution. Because that then creates an immediate start to that relationship as soon as that person is in place. You can go into an, any area and officers from the same police force, you can speak to one and they will be completely bought into what we're doing and will support it and buy into it and, and, and do everything they can. You can speak to one of their colleagues who will go, I have no idea who you are, I don't know what you're doing, I am not going to be sharing any information with you, this is police data, why would I give this to you? They don't understand the concept around information sharing agreements because they're not taught that at that basic level at the beginning you know so there's a piece around officer education when new officers join the job to understand the incredible amount of money that goes into the private sector to try and address this and how it's an untapped resource that can really support the police to be more effective in what they're trying to do if they see industry as an ally rather than someone expecting too much of them the situation changes drastically. So what we're looking for, and I think what would be huge, is the legitimisation of these third sector, private sector parties that are working collaboratively to try and address an issue, that if that is then police know, partners know, the BCRP is doing really good things, can work with you, join the dots, bring everyone together, that is a game changer. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to move us on. Uh, Baroness Hughes. Thank you, Chair. Um, a different tack. I'm, I'm just interested in the extent to which you feel 
that businesses and private companies um, see their own responsibility for trying to prevent some of this activity. Firstly, at the level of their own businesses, so trying to design out opportunity for crime, um, and to what extent your organisations support them with best practice in that. Um, and secondly, by contributing to partnerships like the Business Partnerships and Pegasus to, to collectively try and take a more preventative approach. So, you know, I think we've all been in the convenience stores with the very expensive alcohol all there on the shelf, ready to be just gathered up and run out with. Um, and there's, you know, less obvious practices that stores can institute to try and design out crime, the target hardening approach. So what about this issue of responsibility on them? How do you see that? How do they see it? And what do your organisations do to support them in that? So Sophie and James I mean, first, perhaps, and then... Yes. <coughs> Shall I give, um, as I mentioned earlier, the huge investment by, by our sector, and that goes across other sectors of retail as well, in terms of crime prevention. So over, well over 300 million <coughs> um, invested last year. And that's on things like CCTV, increasingly seeing body-worn cameras, headsets... Um, monitoring systems but on top of that there is a lot of uh, designing out crime the most specific one being um, sight lines through to um, higher value products is the most is the most um, obvious one and also some things that actually don't cost but they cost a bit of time but don't cost money things like greeting every customer that comes into the store yes. and that just recognition mm. of that customer or potential thief that they've been noticed is actually very important as well um, but there are some certain sort of fundamentals we're open long hours we're often in areas that doesn't have a lot of police presence um, around us. We sell, we sell products that people want, hopefully, because we want to sell them. Um, and that does mean that we are, we are vulnerable to that extent. There is, there is, there is always going to be, um, unless, unless we shut down the stores or build up stores as fortresses, there is going to be a, a risk of some theft. And clearly, there's a massive incentive for our sector to, to reduce that level of, uh, of theft because it's a, a huge cost for the business. I mean, just to, I'm sure everyone knows this, but just a, a myth that I sometimes hear occasionally is, oh, you claim it's all back on insurance, don't you? Well, absolutely not. You do not get insured against shop theft. Those are losses straight off the bottom line um, of, um, of that business. So I think there has been an, an awful a lot of investment we share a lot of good practice with retailers about things like reporting which we talked about a little bit already um, but also designing out crime um, being a good witness so sort of get, getting good evidence about when there's been an incident to gather the evidence to pass it to the police so I think a lot of good advice being shared already I think if if, I, if one of my, my members was here receiving that question they would probably reflect some frustration that they don't feel they have enough support from the police they are legitimate businesses paying taxes, contributing a great deal to the economy, providing essential local services, whether that's mm -hmm. post offices, other bill payment services, parcel services, pharmacies in some cases, and they need more support to be able to continue to offer, offer those services in the community. Thank you. Um, with the big businesses buying into um, these schemes, um, yes, it is their responsibility to look after our, themselves, just like it's our responsibility to secure our property. Um, um, so... But you do find that the same ones are the ones that are investing in these schemes and they're paying into the likes of Pegasus and the Business Crime Reduction Partnerships and they're really taking an active role. Um, so we do need to get more of engagement from, from all businesses in taking that responsibility. Um, business Crime Reduction Partnerships also offer a lot of uh, training for staff working on the ground. So many will offer things like um, de-escalation techniques and conflict management, um, as well as other more broader safety techniques for the town centre as well. So again, back to that engagement and making sure that everyone's fully engaged and they are taking it as their responsibility. I mean, yeah, Sophie's just touched on I think one of the areas we didn't really touch on with BCRPs is, is the training and upskilling element of it. That's, they work, we work on the principle, you know, the, the, the criminology principle around the offender triangle, you know, you remove one element of the offender victim location. Well, we can't remove the location because we want thriving high streets and shops to be bricks and mortar out there. So it's focusing on the other two. We target hard and we upskill, we educate the businesses on what they can do. You know, the, the National Business Crime Centre, as part of the, the National Police Chiefs Council, does amazing work around pushing out best practice guidance, and a lot of BCRPs will then use that as the formation of their training. But then also focusing on the offender and being offender-led. IDing the, the offenders, who are those most prolific offenders, and ensuring that the businesses are aware of who they are. Because, as James mentioned, one of the biggest tools that we teach is the power of hello. The engagement with offenders as they walk through the door, 
they know when they have been recognised and that will be a deterrent to a lot of offenders. You deter before they get in the door or as they're coming in the door. They can only do that if they're equipped with that information and that is one of the fundamental um, elements that the BCRPs bring. Here are your top ten offenders in, the, in this area. If they walk in your door, go and speak to them, don't leave their side, offer them a basket, things like that. And it's, it's shown that it has an impact. But the businesses understandably have to create a balance of making money and putting products where the, 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 the statistics tell them they should put them compared to where we think they should yeah. put them to try and avoid crime. And there's constant conversations around trying to find a balance there. We're not in a position to tell businesses what they should or shouldn't do with their stock, but we can always ensure that they are given best practice and they are given guidance and support them if they have any questions around it. Can I, can I just ask you very quickly to, to answer one element of the question, which I think we haven't really explored, and that is whether you believe that there is a responsibility on businesses to fund these sort of partnerships. Should businesses be funding them at all, or should it not be the responsibility of the state? Very quickly. Yeah, I think businesses should be playing a part in partnerships, sharing information, working with other businesses, lo local police and others. I think actually that's more important than the funding, frankly, from businesses. Yeah, but, but funding there is can be a funding part of needed, it. I accept entirely. Yeah. If they don't participate, they're not going to benefit. Yeah. Participation, I accept. I'm asking specifically the question, should they be funding it or should the state be funding schemes I like that? I think it's both, actually. I think it's a partnership of both. Okay. I think, I think industry has demonstrated its willingness to fund initiatives if they work. Okay. And ultimately, it's whether this is going to have the impact that they want. I think there should be more funding from the state. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very quick question. Um, in terms of working together, discussing how to make things better, easier, safer, um, a friend last evening told me that she um, saw someone stealing a bottle of wine, went and told the member of staff. My friend was then followed to her home, threatened. The car came in. It was horrendous. Do you actually discuss how you deal with helping the public um, or making sure if that situation occurs, you might see that person home or whatever? It's a really good question. I mean, that, that actually not a scenario we hear about a lot, but I mean, it's, it's obviously a horrific situation you've, you've um, described there, and that's quite, that's quite a common occurrence for colleagues in store, yes. less so for customers. But certainly in that situation, um, you know, retailers should be thinking about how they can support that, uh, that customer who's obviously, obviously helped them. And, um, and, and, and I think, yeah, that, that, that's obviously putting, putting them in a really uncomfortable position. So that's it's about awareness the across the board, isn't it? It's vulnerability. Yeah. I think yeah. it's, what, it's the wider element. Uh, partnerships look at vulnerability as a whole because that's yeah. situationally contextual. Is it a nightclub? Is it a shop? If someone has demonstrated that they're vulnerable by the fact that they have challenged a shoplifter mm. and they might be in a vulnerable position, then the staff are encouraged on how they could support that mm. person. As James said, it doesn't happen very often. Our reach to the public is very minimal. We engage with our members, and that's right. where that difficulty lies. Yeah. But I do think it comes back to one of your earlier points around better education around all the measures that are out there. Because if we talk to the members of the public around things like the Ask for Angela campaign that Sophie mentioned earlier, most of them are very, very happy to hear that something like that is in place. Yeah. So I think the public want to hear these positive things happening, but radio silence means they assume nothing is happening, and then they hear the negative stories in the media and the press and so therefore I think there is a piece here about education to upskill people as well. Very useful. Uh, Lord Henley. Um, you, you talk about the benefits of um, those businesses taking part in schemes like Pegasus. Um, what's the effect on those that don't take part? Yes. Um, so I, I kind of characterised um, some of the challenges our members face about being from these local offenders who commit a very high volume of crime, often unknown, and the, the, the challenge is to, have, is, to, is to have those crimes reported so those individuals can be dealt with, whether that's through, um, whether that's through sentencing, whether that's through rehabilitation orders, whatever it, whatever it might be, to take those, those people out of the cycle of reoffending. There are also, in the retail industry as a whole, uh, many offenders who are travelling from area to area across force boundaries and committing crime and that's often pretty organized crime people going into centers and 
and, and stripping out stores in a very serious um, and, and, and large scale. That is less directly relevant to us. Some members, some members do engage with those, uh, with Operation Pegasus and, and similar cross-force um, initiatives. There's always the risk that where one set of offenders is, is targeted, um, there's a, a kind of knock-on effect to those who aren't taking part and to other offenders. I think in this case, because you've, firstly, there may be some offenders who are going to be caught as part of Pegasus who would have committed crimes in, in their local store or in another local store who might be part of their, their um, travelling. So that's a good thing for us to, to, um, to have them taken out of the system if that's, if that's the effect. In this instance, I don't actually fear a massive knock-on effect to the smaller stores. But I do think there's a risk is where you have some city centre initiatives and town centre initiatives that can focus on making those places much safer. And that can displace crime into the outlying areas. And so we need to think about how we deal with that. But there's something on the, in, the, in the middle of that as well, which is more localised, organised crime. And one of the things that we're seeing is that vulnerable person, often with addiction problems, going into the store, stealing to order, stealing for resale, often being exploited in doing that by someone who is organising that. And one of the perhaps underreported and underrecognised features of cost of living challenges, what we're not seeing actually is loads of new people suddenly starting to steal. And there will be new people who are, who are stealing, but by and large, I'm a member's report, it's the same people. But what we have seen is a greater appetite to buy those stolen goods. And that may be because people feel they can, they can turn a blind eye to a degree when they're doing that, even if they wouldn't go and commit the primary offence of stealing from the store um, themselves. So I think that um, public awareness, which we talked about a little bit earlier, I would say around buying stolen goods, if you've got a deal that's too good to be true, and it probably is, well, where, is, where has that product come from? And it's probably been stolen from a legitimate retailer. So I think that, that um, whether that's through people buying in pub car parks over the internet, or indeed from other shops that it's got into, I think that's a really serious and under-discussed under issue. Lord Santos. I've got a supplementary on that. Um, are the police going after the organised receivers? It's a difficult question to answer um, be because the <coughs> how much they are able to go after that side of things de is determined by how much they're able to look at the offenders. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem because at the moment, if they don't have the resources to look mm -hmm. at the offenders, then they, what they're not able to do is then look two stages down the line. That is where private industry is able to support because you know, organisations like ours, the similar organisations around the country, are able, we have the time and the energy, to look at that. Where is this stuff going? Where is it being sold? And we find things like Instagram accounts, Etsy accounts, TikTok accounts that are being used to facilitate the selling of these products. You know, you'll find videos of people sort of almost boasting about the level of product that they've taken from these stores. What we want is almost to say we're happy to do that work, but then it needs to, the police are able to then take that on and investigate further, which at the moment, resource wise, they just don't have that time to do it. I think there is a lot of, there's a lot of positives that could come from going down that line though. Yes. I don't think they're doing nearly enough to investigate that and to look into that. And again, it comes back to Adam's point about viewing the level of volume of crime in, our sector, in, in the retail industry as being just too big to get our arms around. We need to turn that round and look at it as a data resource because you can, if, and using that effectively means you're going to find those repeat offenders. You're then going to find their handlers and the people who are exploiting them. You're then going to find the people who are reselling the stolen goods. All that adds up to a lot of very serious crime and very um, uh, uh, motivated criminals who could be addressed and taken out of the system, taken out of the cycle of revenue. How do we do that? And I appreciate that's not an easy thing to do, but that I, I, I just don't think that challenge is even being taken on in many areas at the moment. Without receivers, you don't have yeah. anything for the thieves. Yeah. Very helpful. Um, but Lord Henley, I think you want to pursue a bit more. Uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> Lord Sanders. Sorry, uh, it's pursue a bit more in relation to data gathering. Facial recognition technology. Um, is, is it useful and cost efficient? And are people using it? And what about the convenience stores in particular? I mean, what proportion install it now? 
Yeah, it's still relatively low numbers are using it, so we're certainly talking you know, sub sub ten percent of stores, and, and, and probably quite a bit lower than that. But there are some groups that are using it. There are some individual retailers that use it, and many of them report some good results. And the the way it works, when it works for them is that with that uh, recognition as they, as they come in matching against the database of other local offenders who are part of that scheme, yes. um, that they then get a ping on their phone, their colleagues or the retailer gets a ping, and they can then engage with that, that customer as they come in. There so are, that's proactive. So it's as, as a person comes into the store, yes. they are then told about that, and they can then go and, go and engage. And then there's after the event too, isn't there? Yeah, well, so one of the challenges with the, the system as, as it works, as, as I've described, is that it does then lead to an interaction between those two people. Now, that can result in the would-be thief re seeing they've been recognised, realising that that's probably a harder target, and leaving, and in reality, probably going somewhere else, but nonetheless, they have left the store. So that can work. It can also bring forward that moment and that trigger for, um, for confrontation, which we know can lead to serious issues. So where with the right training and within the right context in the store there are members who report it being very successful i don't think it's simply a case of you install that system and then you know immediately your crime goes down there are no further consequences it needs a lot of management by the police certainly i think that um, facial recognition can have a, a massive impact essentially in all the challenges we've talked about in terms of reporting and data gathering and making that a lot more a lot slicker and more effective to identify those persistent repeat offenders. There's, there's such an amount of nervousness from that industry around the legalities, you know, the human rights element, because with that facial recognition, the live facial recognition, you're scanning everyone, and so therefore you are processing somebody's data as they walk in the store, even if they're not an offender. There's some concerns around accuracy and stuff. You, you mentioned around that proactive... Identifying people who've actually been in a yes. There isn't an issue. No. Is the other issue? side of that, then, is what a lot of partnerships do, which is to use the technology to run against the database of known offenders yeah. using the information that comes in. These people have already offended, which is why they're in a database, and then afterwards working collaboratively with the police to go after those offenders knowing that they are offenders. So that's the, the difference, because the, there's so much nervousness around the live recognition. A lot of retailers just are not willing to even entertain it until a lot further down the line. Using it simply to identify someone you've seen taking yeah. a bottle of wine and rushing out. That's where it is incredibly valuable yes. because it allows us to streamline that investigation work and present more comprehensive evidence to the police to make them more efficient. Well, let's uh, take that a bit further. Baroness Meacher. Um, uh, perhaps initially to Sophie. Um, uh, what factors in relation to uh, t technology more generally are important to uh, a retailer's capacity to deal with shoplifting, uh, would you say? Um, so it comes to the reporting of crime with the technology. Mm. Um, so one of the uh, main problems that faced is the system that the police use to gather um, CCTV, mm -hmm. and it's now done by um, an online electronic version. Mm -hmm. um, so a retailer will be expected to submit the CCTV electronically via a link. However, a lot of retailers don't have the capacity for this on their mm. systems that they have, mm. um, and some don't even have internet access mm. on their in their stores or computer systems. Mm. Um, so I think that would be one of the main challenges. Mm. Yes, I mean, what is the impact of this, the importance of this technology to small businesses, for example? Would you say they're really at quite a disadvantage, or how would you see that? Yes, certainly there are... Um, some of the most uh, uh, impactful technology mm. comes with a high price tag, as you, as you would expect. So I'm particularly thinking about things like monitoring technology, but I think mm. as that's, that develops further and the price hopefully comes down, you know, you have the, um, the, the potential for the using the, the, the systems to recognise certain behaviours and mm. actions in store to then target um, the, the data capture around those but then also to package that for the police automatically. Mm -hmm. So it's taking down all of these manual processes and reporting, which at the moment, as I described early on, is a really laborious process that really mm. um, dissuades a lot of retailers from doing it. We still think they should, but it does dissuade retailers from doing it. Mm. It's a much more automated in terms of identifying those behaviours, um, linking them to things, um, integrating with the system to link it through to, for example, um, uh, uh, sales data and so on, and be able to track in, track in how people have been in the store. So linking those systems together, <coughs> packaging for the police in the most effective way possible mm -hmm. so that they can access that data without 
um, all of the laborious mm. manual sifting through, which we know takes them a lot of time. They should, they should do, but it does take a lot of time. That's, that's huge on them because the onerous expectation on the police for the level of investigation for low-level crime mm. is, is a barrier because, yeah, yeah you're taking a, an officer out of action to go and do all these things whereas actually the technology is there to automate a lot of this work the, the knowledge and expertise in the in the industry is huge you know there are people out there who can do their own statements yeah. they are able to uh, you know submit evidence they can put packages together yeah. that are, if we can get 80 percent of that done and then that is presented to a police officer yeah. who then makes the decision over yeah. whether charging is going to take place or presents it to the cps Very that's fair. a far more efficient method for it rather than a police officer having to physically go and do these things to try and deal with often retail staff who are working on their own in a store Absolutely. however many hours. Absolutely. Well, very helpful responses from all three of you. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Uh, and finally, Lord Bark. Thank you very much, Lord Chairman. Um, there's a, this may be a time when police confidence, public confidence in the police isn't as high as it should be. I mean, it, it's maybe much too low than it really ought to be mm -hmm. given what's happened to the police in the course of the last number of years. But the, my question is, do policing and business partnerships have a public buy-in and is it important that they should do so? We have heard evidence that those partnerships have certainly recently been working much better than they were before. Is that your experience and your members' experience? And what about the future? I think Start with you. Andy. Yeah, I think, I think we've got an, uh, many, many examples of, of it working, of good news stories. And one of our primary focuses is to try and promote that in order to improve people's confidence in the police because they are doing some wonderful work behind the scenes and often they're not very good at talking about it. Um, what we do is not complicated. It's a very simple procedure. And, you know, as an example, some of our areas will create a top 10 list and then that's presented to the local police and they know the top 10 offenders hitting business crime. So they can then go out operationally and deal with that. They then tell us, we've arrested, we've charged, we've put in prison. We then tell the businesses, this has happened. The businesses go, that's brilliant. We'll keep doing this. Yeah. That, it, it, that's, it's that positive yeah. reinforcement. The public side is so difficult because we don't have that access to the public. Mm -hmm. But obviously, the people who work in the stores are members of the public. They are from the local community. And their reassurance and faith and confidence in the police is so vital mm -hmm. that the more engagement we get with these partnerships that demonstrate that positive work mm -hmm. and the positive mm -hmm. outcomes will increase public confidence mm -hmm. because it's the staff who work in the stores, who live locally, who talk to mm -hmm. their families, talk to their friends and explain it. And then the more that happens, the more we can start promoting this work and make it a widerly, wider available piece of information. Um, as Adam said, you know, a lot of people who work in shops um, are members of the community and it's something like one in ten people in the UK work in retail. Uh, so if we can get the buy-in of people who work in retail and that confidence in the police, then we go a long way in developing that for the wider population as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's all about feedback and feeding back the good news stories. Of, too often we focus on the negative. So if we can feed back where we do have positive results, then I think that will go a long way in helping to rebuild public confidence. Mm. Jeff, just to add, I had to say that um, often communities yeah, can feel quite powerless in the face of, um, of, of, of seeing a lot of crime, and I think where partnerships are effective, that can give them a lot of confidence. Um, so it's the, 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 the confidence and the support will be entirely based on the success of those partnerships and communicating that well. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all very much. Um, can I say on behalf of all of us, uh, thank you for the work that you're doing, uh, enormously valuable. Thank you for the evidence you've given. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, if there are further things you think we need to learn uh, that you wished you'd said and hadn't said, please get in touch mm -hmm. with us as quickly as possible.